For C.S. Lewis, imagination was more than a tool for creating stories or ideas. It was a space where deep truths could be explored and understood. He did not see imagination as something singular and fixed, but as a set of complementary parts, each with its own function. This perspective helped him create stories and images that made complex ideas clearer and more accessible, connecting readers to something greater. But what he perceived in imagination was not just useful for writing. It also teaches us much about how we can use it in our own life and faith. In his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis describes three different ways of using imagination. The first he calls daydream or fantasy. This type of imagination is self-centered. It's like when we imagine ourselves as heroes of a story, the center of a world where everything revolves around us. Who hasn't done that? Our dreams of power, fame or success often stem from this kind of fantasy. It seems harmless, but it can isolate us and distance us from what is real, creating a false world that can never satisfy us. The second form of imagination is invention, something Lewis mastered with expertise. Here, imagination doesn't create a world to escape reality but helps us see reality more clearly. Through a good story or a powerful image, we can understand deep truths in a way that wouldn't be possible with direct explanations alone. It's like when we look out a window and notice details we hadn't seen before. The beauty of the sky, the colors of the leaves, the sunlight. Invention helps us see the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. While daydreaming is like a closed loop, where everything is centered on ourselves. Invention is like a bridge. It connects us to something greater, leads us to see beyond ourselves, and teaches us something new about life, the world, and even about God. Lewis believed that imagination, used correctly, could illuminate the heart and bring us closer to the truth. The third distinction that C.S. Lewis makes about imagination is the highest and perhaps the most mysterious. Here, imagination is not just a daydream or a tool to comprehend reality, but a window to something beyond ourselves. This form of imagination, according to Lewis, is linked to what he calls joy, a glimpse of something greater, a touch of transcendence that awakens a deep desire. It's a peculiar joy, different from common pleasure, because it comes accompanied by a feeling of longing, a burning desire for something we have not yet achieved, but know to be real. Lewis uses the German word Sehnsucht to describe this feeling, a nostalgic and unfulfilled desire. This longing, however, is not a meaningless frustration. It's like the light of a distant lighthouse, pointing to a true destination. For Lewis, the highest function of imagination is to help us recognize and follow this call, to understand that our deepest longings have a purpose, someone who can fully satisfy them at the right time. This joy, then, is not an end in itself, but a sign, a direction toward what is eternal. Although Lewis extensively explores this experience of joy in his writings, such as in Surprised by Joy. His power as an author resides primarily in his ability to use the second form of imagination, representation. He creates stories and images that help us see the truth more clearly, illuminating what might otherwise seem confusing or distant. Lewis believes that imagination is fundamental in this process because, as he writes, Reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. While reason organizes facts and concepts, imagination brings these facts to life, helping us understand their deeper meaning. It's as if reason were a detailed and precise map, 
but imagination is the actual landscape the map describes, alive, full of colours, sounds and emotions, through stories and creative representations, dry and abstract truths take shape, connecting directly to the heart and spirit. This doesn't mean that reason should be disregarded. On the contrary, Lewis reminds us that reason and imagination must work together. Reason helps us discern what is true, while imagination helps us understand why that truth matters and how it relates to our deepest being. Ultimately, imagination points us to what is beyond this world, helping us navigate life with a clearer sense of purpose and direction. C.S. Lewis saw imagination as an essential instrument for understanding the deeper meaning of things, but its importance is often misunderstood. As he himself writes, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. However, imagination as a bearer of truth is frequently underestimated. We often limit its function to childhood or mere entertainment, associating it with what is just imaginary, as if it were synonymous with falsehood. This reduces it to something trivial, forgetting that it is a vital source of meaning, capable of revealing dimensions of reality that reason alone cannot reach. The American poet and author Wendell Berry brilliantly describes this unique capacity of imagination, correcting the misconception that devalues it. He writes, Worst of all, the fundamentalists of both science and religion do not understand or adequately respect imagination. Is imagination merely a talent, like a good singing voice, the ability to invent things or think up things or have ideas? Or is it like science, a way of knowing things that cannot be known in any other way? We have many reasons to think that it is a way of knowing things that would not be knowable otherwise. As the word itself suggests, it is the power to make us see, and to see, moreover, things that without it would be invisible. In one of its aspects, it is the power by which we sympathize. Through it, we can see what it was to be Odysseus, or Penelope, David, or Ruth, or what it is to be someone's neighbor or enemy. Through it, we can see ourselves as others see us. It is also the power by which we see the place, situation, or story we are in. Imagination, therefore, is not merely a game of ideas, but a form of knowledge that connects us to the invisible and teaches us to see beyond the surface. It is through it that we understand not only the reality of the world around us, but also the grand narrative of which we are a part, the story that encompasses all times, uniting past, present and future. And this vision is especially essential in matters of faith. While reason gives us the tools to analyze and understand the world, imagination makes the difference by allowing us to participate in it more deeply. It helps us recognize our role in a larger story, the story that God is telling in every detail of creation. When we open ourselves to this perception, we begin to see not only the facts of our existence, but also the purpose that gives them meaning. It is imagination that teaches us to live in that tension between what is visible and what is promised, nurturing our faith and our hope in what is yet to come. When we exercise faith, we are not just engaging our heart or our reason, we are also activating our imagination. Faith, after all, is the certainty of things not seen, and imagination is the tool that allows us to give form to the invisible. We use words to define what we can observe in the world, but these definitions as the word itself suggests, are limited to the finite. God, being infinite, completely escapes that category. Our reason, when confronted with him, is insufficient. It collapses under the weight of the eternal. 
to speak about God, we rely on what medieval scholastics called via analogia, the way of analogy. Thus we turn to images, stories and metaphors that can point us towards what transcends our human limitations. Jesus, the greatest storyteller, knew this deeply. He spoke about the kingdom of heaven not in direct terms, but in parables and comparisons. The kingdom is like a man who sows seeds, like yeast that makes the bread rise, like a hidden treasure or a merchant seeking precious pearls. These likes give us access to the infinite through the familiar, using human experiences to glimpse the attributes of God. They are imaginative representations that allow us, even partially, to touch the divine immensity. Even so, our vision is limited. As Paul writes, we see through a glass darkly. Reason alone cannot take us beyond that glass because faith relates to the invisible, the indiscernible. Here imagination becomes essential, keeping our understanding of heavenly things alive. It helps us explore concepts like heaven, the eternal longing, Sehnsucht, and all that we know deep down exists but cannot fully experience in this world. Lewis knew the value of imagination, but also faced an internal struggle to reconcile it with his rationalist worldview in his youth. He saw reason as the great mediator of truth, but felt that his imagination led him to something deeper, something his initial materialism couldn't explain. In his poem, Reason, he expresses this struggle by asking, who will make the explorative and blurred touch of imagination? Ever report the same as intellectual sight? This conflict was not just his. It's a common tension among many Christians today. We underestimate imagination, relegating it to something childish or, or fanciful, when in fact it plays a crucial role in our approach to God. By doing so, we miss the opportunity to explore what it offers us, a bridge between the finite and the infinite, between the visible and the invisible. To overcome this division, we need a more robust view of imagination. It is not a substitute for reason, but its partner, functioning in different yet complementary ways. While reason structures and analyzes, imagination allows us to intuit, visualize and experience. Together they form a powerful alliance, enabling us to explore and comprehend the divine mystery more deeply. C.S. Lewis had a fascinating and detailed understanding of imagination, recognizing that it was not just a generic tool of creativity, but something deeply nuanced. He identified more than 30 different forms of imagination, each with its unique function. Some help us understand and explore truth, while others can lead us into error or illusion. This rich insight invites us to reflect on how we use our imagination daily, especially in matters of life, faith and understanding the world. One of the deepest forms of imagination Lewis describes is the penetrating imagination. This form seeks to go beyond the surface, examining an idea or object from various angles using different metaphors and perspectives to reach a more complete understanding. Lewis saw Shakespeare as a master of this ability, capable of using multiple images and descriptions to capture the essence of a thing. For example, when describing love or death, Shakespeare didn't limit himself to a single metaphor. He created a kaleidoscope of images that allowed the reader to explore these realities in depth. This approach not only enriches our understanding, but also reminds us that truth is rarely simple or one-dimensional. Penetrating imagination invites us to look at the world with curiosity, recognizing that there is always more to discover. As Lewis pointed out, even when we think we have the right word, it is rarely the last. 
There is always room to expand and integrate our understanding, seeing individual truths in relation to one another. Not all forms of imagination are necessarily beneficial. Lewis describes transformative imagination, which can lead us to idealize something or someone beyond what is real or deserved. This type of imagination projects our hopes and expectations onto an object of affection, creating an inflated vision that inevitably leads to disappointment. For example, we might imagine a relationship, a job, or an experience as the perfect solution to all our problems, only to discover later that our idealization was illusory. Similarly, Generous imagination can embellish an idea or object excessively, blinding us to its flaws or limitations. Lewis warned about the dangers of groupthink born from this form of imagination, where loyalty to the inner circle surpasses truth or wisdom. This type of imagination can lead us to follow ideas or groups without question, simply because we want to believe in what they represent. To understand these nuances more concretely, let's consider a positive and a negative example. Positive use. Imagine penetrating imagination being applied to a biblical passage or an ethical dilemma. Instead of accepting a superficial interpretation, we seek to explore multiple layers, considering different contexts and images that help us understand the deeper meaning. This use of imagination brings us closer to truth and gives us a richer and more integrated vision. Negative use. Now think of transformative imagination. In action in a relationship, we might project unrealistic expectations onto another person, imagining they are perfect or capable of meeting all our needs. This idealization not only harms the relationship, but also blinds us to the true complexity and beauty of who the person really is. C.S. Lewis, with his keen sensitivity to the nuances of imagination, describes satisfied imagination as that which finds pleasure in the familiar and in the repetition of the mundane. It is a gaze that recognizes in what is apparently common a reflection of the divine order that sustains all things. Lewis admired medieval scholastics as masters of this form of imagination. They created a cosmological model of incredible complexity and repetition, in which the earth was seen as a realm of change and decay, while the heavens represented perfect and unchanging order. Contemplation of the celestial spheres brought them closer to God, the ultimate source of all order and harmony. In the medieval view, the order of the heavens was a pattern to be imitated on earth. They delighted in the idea that perfection is, in essence, well-ordered repetition. The sun rises and sets, the stars shine in the firmament, and every element of creation faithfully fulfills its nature. Only human beings have the power to break this pattern, introducing disorder and randomness into a universe that otherwise constantly points to the Creator. Lewis believes that the ordered repetition of the familiar helps us understand that God is both the foundation and sustainer of our reality. He writes that once we understand this, the entire world can become a channel through which we experience the divine presence. This perception invites us to a re-enchantment of what we already know, to look at the world with new eyes. The poet G.K. Chesterton expresses this idea powerfully. If you look at a thing 999 times, you are perfectly safe. If you look at it the thousandth time, you are in peril of seeing it for the first time. This thousandth look is the essence of satisfied imagination, an openness to seeing God's glory in the ordinary. Lewis observes that the simplest pleasures of life, the soft fur of a dog, the explosion of green leaves on trees in spring, 
are shafts of glory that illuminate our sensibility, but we often fail to perceive their divine origin. We become asleep to this truth, blind to the miracle unfolding around us. To fully use satisfied imagination, Lewis identifies four obstacles we must overcome. Inattention. Often we are simply not conscious enough to notice the beauties and orders around us. The wrong kind of attention. We might think that the pleasure we feel in the mundane is purely internal or accidental, without connection to the divine. Greed. We desire to repeat pleasurable experiences incessantly, forgetting that their purpose is to point to something greater. Pride. We might believe we have discovered something exclusive, a secret others cannot share. These challenges distance us from the ability to experience reality as a reflection of God's greatness. As the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. But as Lewis emphasizes, we are often essentially asleep, unable to see beyond the mundane. We need to awaken and remain awake so we can experience the miracle of the everyday. Satisfied imagination challenges us to look at the world around us with a spirit of contemplation and gratitude, recognizing that every part of creation is filled with meaning. It corrects our tendency always to seek the new, the next thing, and reminds us that God breaks into our lives not only in great revelations, but in the small pleasures of daily life. By opening ourselves to this re-enchantment of the familiar, we learn to live what Chesterton called the thousandth look. In that moment, the ordinary becomes extraordinary and the world around us transforms into a living reflection of divine glory. This perception brings us closer to God and allows us to participate, albeit imperfectly, in the eternal harmony that sustains all creation. C.S. Lewis recognized imagination as a powerful force, capable of revealing deep truths or ensnaring us in dangerous illusions. Controlled imagination is one of these negative forms where the ego uses imagination to manipulate, idealize, or project selfish desires onto others. In this type of imagination, the self becomes the center of the universe, with everything and everyone existing only to satisfy one's own whims and ambitions. This form of imagination, as Lewis suggests, is similar to wish fulfillment, but goes further by actively seeking to influence and dominate others. Imaginative control not only creates fantasies of superiority, but also nurtures and directs them toward actions in the real world. Lewis also connects this dynamic to what he calls servile activity, a submissive and degraded use of imagination that keeps the individual trapped in a spiral of selfish and unattainable dreams. In contrast, free activity of imagination, which is creative and generous, places the self outside the center allowing truth and reality to be the focus. George MacDonald, a great spiritual mentor to Lewis, captured the essence of the problem by writing, the one principle of hell is, I am my own. This principle sums up the trap of controlled imagination, the creation of a world that revolves around the self, isolating us from truth, from others, and ultimately from God. Lewis offers a brilliant personification of this concept in the screw tape letters, where an experienced demon teaches his nephew how to manipulate a human soul. Screw tape instructs that the best way to draw someone away from God is not direct confrontation, but subtle distraction, feeding selfish thoughts, illusions of control, and fantasies of grandeur. Controlled imagination, in this context, not only isolates but also destroys, separating us from the reality that calls us out of ourselves. 
One of the most harmful aspects of controlled imagination is its ability to foster a deliberate ignorance about our inner life. Instead of inviting us to examine our motives and desires, it encourages us to avoid introspection, keeping us trapped in superficial machinations that mask the true issues of our heart and soul. This type of imagination prefers fantasy over reality, placing a veil between us and the world as it truly is. Lewis warns against this tendency by writing, all reality is iconoclastic. Reality, with its unyielding truth, breaks our false images and selfish idols. This process can be painful, but is liberating because it helps us see the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. When we allow reality to shatter our illusions, we make room for a free and true imagination that reflects the divine order instead of our own disordered desires. The most powerful antidote to controlled imagination is intentional and honest self-examination. We need to turn our gaze inward and ask ourselves, what am I truly desiring? Who is at the center of my world? This practice, though challenging, helps us unveil the selfish motivations that fuel controlled imagination. Through this awareness, we can redirect our imagination towards something healthier and aligned with reality. The free activity of imagination, on the other hand, offers a redemptive alternative. In this mode, the self is not the center, and imagination becomes a bridge to truth, not a prison of the ego. This imagination creates, explores, and contemplates the world as it is, allowing us to participate in a greater reality, in harmony with God and others. Controlled imagination imprisons us in a cycle of selfishness and illusion, but reality, as Lewis writes, is our liberator. It destroys our idols and calls us to a broader life where the self loses its tyranny and truth takes its place. Cultivating imagination in a free and true way allows us to experience the depth of the world and of faith, not as we invent it, but as it truly is. This freedom is a reflection of the divine order, a reminder that we were made not to serve ourselves, but to participate in something infinitely greater. Imagination, in its highest use, is an instrument to glorify God. It reconciles us with a larger and deeper world, helping us see not only its beauties, but also its pains and failures exactly as they are without distortions of our desires or prejudices. Through it, we gain a hope grounded in reality, an idealism that does not ignore truth. Imagination helps us realize that God is present in all things, even when his presence often seems hidden. As Lewis writes, the world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. The real labor is to remember, to attend, in fact, to come awake, still more, to remain awake. By using our imagination in a reconciliatory way, we are invited to see what Lewis calls the bright blur of God. He cannot be contained or defined by our concepts, but we can glimpse him through created things. Every act of imagination that broadens our understanding of the world, that brings us closer to truth, is an opportunity to deepen our relationship with him. In an experiment in criticism, Lewis expresses a deep desire to transcend the limits of his own perception. He laments that his own eyes are not enough to see the world as it truly is. He wishes to see what others have seen, and more so, what they have imagined. In his ideal vision, even animals could share their perspective allowing humans to see the world through the eyes of a bee, a mouse, or even to feel sense as a dog perceives them. This aspiration of Lewis reminds us that we live in the narrow prison of the self, limited by our own experiences and perspectives. Our imagination, however, can free us from this prison 
allowing us to see the world in new lights, expanding our understanding and bringing us closer to God's creation as it truly is. In doing so, we learn to glorify him better as we become more fully what he created us to be, reflections of his image, attentive to what is true and beautiful. Imagination teaches us to remain awake to God's presence in the ordinary. It reminds us that every detail of the world can be a glimpse of his glory if we have eyes to see. The fur of a dog, the smell of wet earth, the movement of the stars, all these are invitations to contemplate the Creator through his works. When we use our imagination to re-enchant the familiar, we are glorifying God by recognizing his hand in all things. God calls us to live and know this world well, and imagination helps us do so. When we use it correctly, it not only broadens us, but also makes us more like him. We are made in the image of a creative God, and our imagination is a reflection of that divine aspect. By creating, contemplating, and understanding, we participate in God's work, glorifying him as we explore and care for his creation. Ultimately, our imagination is a gift that allows us to see beyond the obvious, embrace the complexity of the world, and participate in the mystery of God. When we employ it to see more clearly, to reconcile and understand, we glorify the one who gave us this ability. As Lewis well knew, imagination is a powerful path to draw near to God and his truth, not as an escape from the real, but as a means to see it in all its depth and beauty. Let us pray. Lord God, you who fill the world with your presence and are the source of all order and beauty, awaken in us the ability to perceive you in all things, great and small. Help us to see your hand in the simplest details of our day and in the deepest mysteries of creation. Teach us to remain awake to your constant presence, which shines even in the ordinary and mundane. May we never lose the miracle of looking at the world with new eyes, seeing it as it truly is, a reflection of your glory. Father, we know that our vision is limited and often trapped in our own ego. Free us from this narrow prison of self and give us eyes to see beyond ourselves, to see what others have seen and imagined, and to experience your creation with depth and humility. Broaden our understanding, Lord, and help us escape the illusion that the world exists only for us. May we learn to live in harmony with your order and truth. Open our hearts to perceive that all creation, from the brightness of the stars to the smell of wet earth, is a channel to experience your presence. Teach us to value every detail of the world around us as a gift that reflects your goodness and love. May our eyes open to the thousandth look, the one where we finally see the world as you created it. Creator God, Use our imagination to reflect your creativity and love. May it be an instrument to build, reconcile, and understand, never to destroy or dominate. Help us use this gift to draw near to you, glorifying you in all that we are and do. May our ideas, dreams, and visions always be directed toward your truth, and may we walk toward your eternal purpose. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to see the kingdom in all things, we pray. Amen.